Your Dr. Bruce now returns from his June adventure down in New Zealand and brings you this hot, middle-of-the-summer, July 31st Levity Zone episode. I hope you'll enjoy the following free-flowing rap I delivered in neighboring Australia back in my winter 2015 Levity Tour. Ensconced in a glowing dome at the Earth Frequency Festival, held deep in the gum forests of southern Queensland, I dove into my favorite themes of the long view of our technological evolution that I call the Emerald and the Azure Civilization. Without giving anything more away, suffice it to say that this telling may be the most profound, subtle shifting of our perspective that we are hardly noticing. More later, after the podcast on my recent scientific work in New Zealand and a visit, for real, to Middle Earth. So journey with me now back to that lovely night down under where we looked forward deep into the 21st century to a time when our perspective will be yet more profoundly transformed and where so-called dark and light forces will press tightly together like hands clasping, climbing towards some kind of awakened opening. All right, so our next presentation, which we're going to start a little bit early, um, is once again Dr. Bruce Damer, and he's going to be speaking on the subject of the Emerald and the Azure Civilization. Yeah. Big round of applause. I'm a bit tethered here by this mic, but can you hear me? Can you hear me? If I turn around, will I wind up the cable? Or am I winding me up? Or am I... No, that's all right. Or am I winding you up? That's fine. I think we're good. Yeah. It's so good to be on a tether, isn't it? Sometimes. Ooh. Step back from the microphone, kid. <laughs> so... Everyone out there, you can come in. There's seats in the center right here. If you'd like to occupy the light dome, the dome of the light. There we are. Come on in. Come on in. The desert dwellers are slowly uh, going to be drifting back and as we get started. So my theme tonight is called the Emerald and the Azure Civilization or the Azure and the Emerald Civilization. So where I want to start is uh, this morning we took some medicaments, a group of us, and we walked out of the festival site. You should try this sometime. And we went up toward that mountain there's a Pikes Peak kind of a mountain up there. It's like a plug. Any, at any moment, a UFO is going to come down and park above it. You know, it's that type of a, of a mountain. So, is it a little bit echoey on the speaker? Or are we, we're okay? Is it, about, is it all right? Can, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. So, we'll continue on. So, we were going to get into contact with nature and so what's going on out there and you could hear it during the opening during the opening the cicadas came up right and they're so powerful and I I thought what are these things and it turns out that every seven years or 13 years they come up and we found this tree and on the tree was a little golden carapace a beautiful carapace, a little golden thing that was the body, was the outer shell of one of these, what are they called? Cicadas. 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 And then up the tree, about another meter, was the cicada itself that had shed this envelope. And if you picked up the envelope, it was the most beautiful, shining, golden, translucent thing that you can hold in your hand. Have you ever done that? I guess you grew up with this, right? You guys grew up with this in Australia here? So this was incredible. And our fearless Alima, 
fearless Ali Ma took the cicada off the tree as it was in mid cicad and she said look at him and and the cicada is doing this chirping screaming squealing thing right like what have you done you know I've took me seven years to get up here and you've plucked me off my tree <laughs> you know <laughs> that's kind of the sound <laughs> and there's a third eye in these these guys it's almost like several third eyes flashing they're amazing creatures right it's like the entire Australian scene is based on them and their rhythms right because they come up and they seem to transmute time the cicada transmutes time somehow and it's using the Fibonacci sequence the number of years that the Fibonacci numbers gives you to trick the predators so they can't figure out when they're coming out of the ground did you ever know, did you know that so it's amazing so they've created a clock for life in the gum forest the cicada now as we were coming down the hill we were looking across the valley and we could see you know this festival and hear the stages and things like that and we were looking across the valley and and what I realized was this is the way we used to this is the view we used to have we used to look across forested valleys from a hillside somewhere you know where we would just had just plucked cicadas and probably eaten them so 500,000 years 750,000 years ago we were looking that was our viewpoint we looked across valleys right it was incredible we had an incredible sort of visionary long distance views and we had up up close views too we could see you know a cicada and it's it's third eye but we could see even in more detail this is 700,000 years ago come forward and we discover you know cave living you know the adverts say you know new you know try cave living so we we decide we're going to live in caves and we can do incredible things in caves we can paint the caves we, we can be saved from the weather and the tigers and the th there were echidnas the size of you know school buses right or something at some point here in australia and there were you know roos the size of uh, you know tractors or something like that or even bigger and so it was good to have cave living, but what cave living did was you now looked out through the mouth of the cave and then there was the valley. But you know, you could you could come out you could come out of the valley, uh, out of the cave and still go down into your valley. But then things started to change. We invented the wattle and daub hovel, the beginnings of suburbia, right? So we now we're sort of inside these Rondavel houses. This is what they would call them in South Africa, the Rondavel hovel. You know, three or four of them here, one for the woman there who's going through her menstrual period or menstrual changes, one for the young boys over there. So we started living in enclosures, and the, but there were windows and they were open and the air came through them and we could still sort of look outside, but we might have seen another Rondavel and, you know, a little field here and there you know we would look that was up that became our viewpoint but then things started to shift so something called civilization happened and civilization happened because men figured out how to take gardening from women food production from women and industrialize it they had domesticated the plants we as a civilization domesticated animals and then women were domesticated and this is what i i believe i spoke the other night which was the men figured out how to temper iron make a blade and then cut the earth like the blade was the penis cutting the vulva of the earth continually opening it and they created industrial agriculture <coughs> so in order to do industrial agriculture what it means you can create surpluses you can create these enormous silos and the silo at Jericho was exactly that it was the world's largest grain silo did you know that it was like it was worth so much because it was like a massive grain silo and it meant that you could survive a siege for like two years you know so Jericho 
you know, do, do you know the the legend in the Bible where supposedly the the trumpets were used to send sonic waves at this silo on Jericho and 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 at the city walls and it fell. You know about that? Well, archaeologists actually took some Jericho pumice, some Jericho rock, and they subjected it to sound, and at a certain point it exploded. So it really was brought down by sound. Isn't that crazy? It's a little bit of a diversion. But when you were living in Jericho, you were now seeing the city walls. City walls, city walls, city walls. Because male patriarchy put you in those walls because you had to defend the surplus that was made by agriculture and just beyond the walls you saw fields in the same mountains roll the clock to rome one million people living in rome you had street sanitation you had aqueducts washing out the streets you had the largest warehouse that they found this thing about 20 years ago there was a warehouse that went practically from the port at Ostia. It was one building. It was the largest building in the entire world until, say, the 20th century. And it was a stevedore's warehouse that went and cut right up into Rome, and that's how a million people were supplied with products from the ships. They found bits and pieces of this all over Rome, and they realized this is a huge building. So now you're in a fully urban environment. You're just seeing, you're, you're maybe seeing a little bit of the Italian mountains and hillsides, but you're seeing just houses. House, 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 house. That's your new reality. So you see what's happening is our perspective is going in and in and in. It's going closing down. As our culture gets rich, richer by being in an urban lifestyle, as it gets noisier, but there's less and less and less nature. There's less and less and less, less vista things to see through. So roll the clock into Europe. Europe in the 15th century, warrens of cities, now bigger buildings, buildings based on the old Roman model, big columnar buildings, then steel and glass buildings in the 19th century. And now if you live in Sydney, you know, you might live in a huge tower block. You might live in a you know, a nice little Australian bungalow house, but you're surrounded by 10,000 bungalow houses. You're in this warren, you're in a maze complex. But if you're one of the one billion Chinese that has moved or is actively moving from rice paddy villages into places like Shanghai, where there's, you know, 10,000 50-story apartment blocks, think about them, they went from rice paddy existence overnight to living above a shopping mall in a 50-story apartment building. Their whole perspective went from the time that would be indistinguishable, Confucius would recognize this time, to their boom, they're in this incredible maze of steel and concrete. So then there's another phase. Another phase happens. Does anybody know what, the pers what, what changes next in perspective? Can you guess? What makes our, our viewpoint shorter and shorter and shorter? Devices. Devices. Okay, but before that, what makes us what makes us look closer in? Instead of focusing in the, the room or the, the, the vista, we start huh? Television. Television, yeah, but before that? Yeah. What's that? Selfishness. Selfishness. Well <laughs> the book the book so we become bookish and then we have accountants and we have lawyers and we have bill readers and you know uh, people going on the streets reading the news to the town and they're reading from this perspective now as they're walking as the bill readers walking through the town they're looking at the clock the clock is kind of like the cicadas for humanity the clock was invented in the ninth century to get monks so they could rise at the right time of the morning to do prayers. So this guy, this monk, invented the water clock. Did you know that? And it would be run by water and it would go ding, ding, ding at the right time. Something would fall and go thump and all the monks would get up from their monastery and go do prayers. So they set us up for that. So here we have, we're reading our books, then we sit in front of our telly, 
you don't say telly, that's too palmy, right? Is that palmy? That's Aussie too? Telly? Yeah, yeah. You had the telly tubbies here probably, right? Anyway. So we're looking at television, but we're ever looking out at the clock. And the clock has synchronized us even more and more and more in the last thousand years especially. Now we have these devices in our hands, right? That have a clock in them. They have books in them. And they have this glowing screen that lights our faces. When you look at people's flats at night, what do you see? The glowing screen of big plasma TVs. Blah, blah, blah. It's like this thing, right? It looks like... You, you remember the uh, there's a science fiction movie where you know the tiny the tiny UFO lands in the boy's bedroom you remember this sci-fi movie I can't even remember it and but the, and the the aliens come out and they're only about that tall but the whole room is glowing with alien light well everybody's room is glowing with some kind of alien encounter and it's called television and media the big plasma screen and then here at the festival you know if it was better if there was better uh, Wi-Fi or something. There's a joke sign over there, right, that says Wi-Fi spot. Did you see that? It doesn't work, does it? <laughs> but how many people have gone there and done this and like, oh, bloody hell, you know, it's a joke. But they had hope for a while. <laughs> but so all around the Wi-Fi spot, you see these lit up faces. What are they lit up with? Can anyone give me an answer? What is this? thing that's lighting us up that's what's, what's that a limited, a limited perspective it's a new perspective it's all blue light blue blue light 3200 Kelvin is that the energy of the light it's like daylight well when I was a kid we had old Star Trek this shows how old I am the original Star Trek that nobody here remembers. And I always wondered, I was in a TV show in a documentary with William Shatner about eight years ago. And he in, they interviewed me because I said interesting things about Star Trek back in the day. And one of the things was Spock used to be on the bridge and come over to a hooded screen. And this is before there were any computers, right? This is 1967. And he'd look in and he would say, life suitable for have human habitation oxygen nitrogen blah 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 and his face was always lit by some blue light and it and I always wondered what's this guy seeing on this screen some he's seeing the representation of a whole planet this is 1967 what he's seeing is a blue light bulb probably a Christmas light bulb or something but the Star Trek people sort of dreamed all made all this up right the, a future that we're living in now handheld computers and the tricorder and you know they invented that they just cooked it up out of their imaginations but Spock looked at a blue light too now we all look at blue light blue light blue light and we live in apartment buildings apartment buildings are blue the glass is blue everything is sort of tinted blue and I started to sort of trip out on this and say wait a minute this is all Azure this is all that beautiful but harsh, cold, faceted stone called an azure. You know, and you see them, they're pretty valuable, actually. And then one night I was saying, well, what is going on with this, this azure? And I live in a world where we don't have a plasma TV. We don't even have a network. You know, we don't have anything. I live in the Redwood Forest. And up in the Redwood Forest is, is green, you know. The trees are 100 meters tall. You know, they're beautiful green all year. And I realized I live you know, I went on to Google Maps and Google Earth and I just sort of was scrolling around. It's like, wait a minute, we live in a blue dot, a green dot. We live in an emerald dot. We live in an emerald spot. But right next to us is frickin' Silicon Valley. Google, Apple, everything. You drive 15 minutes this way, Silicon Valley, boom. The heart of the matrix that is making the Azure world. It's right there. My friend is laying out the Apple campus right now. He is, was charged with Steve Jobs as the arborist for Apple to plant 6,000 oak trees. 6,000 trees. He's, he's doing an active forest migration. They're taking hot climate oaks, 6,000 of them, 
from Mexico and southern Arizona, and they're planting them in Cupertino, California, on hills that they've excavated, three, three million cubic yards. I know you're on metric now, but it's like three million cubic, cubic meters, actually, to build this enormous 13,000-person ring building and then put in this massive forest. So he is building a little emerald dot of pristine oak forest with native plants because Apple's pen spending $35 million on the Arbor budget alone and $6 billion on the building, right? Because they have the money to do these kinds of things. But I said to Dave Muffley, I said, you're kind of doing something interesting. He said, yeah, we're doing the largest active forest migration in history because in 50 years, the native oaks of Cupertino are going to be dead. They're going to be reseeded from the Apple Campus oaks. Isn't that cool? When I, where I grew up in British Columbia, there is an area that's a, th a thousand miles wide and 350 miles deep that is dead with bark beetles. All the trees are dead. It's this enormous red swath of destruction because it's too warm and the bark beetles, they, they don't get killed by, you usually get 45 below in the winter. You know, 45 below Celsius in the winter in Canada kills those little bark beetles. Doesn't do that anymore. So the Taigan forest all the way through Siberia, all the way through Canada and into the States is dying massively fast. And my brother lives in the middle of this and he took me by the world's largest pile of logs one million logs they had harvested super fast to send to japan because the japanese love this wood that has the bark beetle traces and it's all blue and a blue trace so they're making furniture but it's a one-time deal because after that all the the wood's lost its oil and it's dead and it's just getting ready to burn in a gigantic fire you know that will burn for a year or two and burn a huge area you know the size of of, of a state here in australia will burn so the, am the emerald world of the Arctic is shifting north fast. So that's a grassland shift of a thousand miles north in two generations. Instant. So we're shifting the whole planet. So that emerald belt of the Taigan forest, the spruce forest, the uh, white pine forest is boom, going like this. It's really dynamic. I go to Peru a couple times a year. The last time I was there, there was a pipeline road cut through where we used to have to canoe for a day. And we went up this pipeline road instead of having to take the canoe. And it was slash and burn, slash and burn, slash and burn, Peruvian army post, gas pipeline company, boom, huge settlement that wasn't even there before. You know, it's incredible. So that was, a, that was a removal of the emerald world too, the old earth. And what I realized is what we're doing as a civilization, if you want to think of it from outside, not a judgment about this, is it's like a brooch. The brooch has a growing gemstone of Azure technology, steel and glass, internet, consumerism, highways. It's getting bigger and bigger in the center. And around are these little dots, these soft green dots of emerald that are getting smaller and smaller down to the point where they become precious. They become precious stones in the brooch of human civilization. So you, you, you know, in a hundred years, a place like this may be controlled access. The Costa Rican cloud forest, which the Costa Ricans have so wisely preserved, may become very limited access for people with money because the rest of the world is Azure because we're going toward that so fast so fast you know it's I mean look at Australia look at the building boom look at Brisbane I mean it was here 10 years ago and Brisbane was a sleepy little place there were a few buildings now there's like a 72 story building in this there's construction when I was staying in Brisbane for three days it was Fortunately, unfortunately for me, it was across from a cement plant. So at five in the morning, it was beep, 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 cement trucks going out, construction, 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 deliver that, that live cement, that concrete to build more and more and more. It's insane here in Australia. There's so much Azure going in. You know, it's incredible. When I went to take a flight from Melbourne to Sydney, 
the Virgin, when I was here 10 years ago, Virgin was just starting here and their computers didn't work. You know, it was called Virgin Blue and like, hey, we don't know what we're doing. Now they run 60 flights a day, 60 flights a day between those two cities. Just one airline is running 60 flights a day. So that's unbelievable. The pace is just unbelievable and it's unstoppable. So where do we go? And at the same time, our perspective, somebody here said limited perspective, I think, is getting like to hear, to hear, to hear, right? From the television, the book, television, we kind of look out the window now and then, boom, 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 and now we're just looking at this. And with augmented reality, we've got it here. We've got lasers projecting it into our retina, you know, by the 2020s, you know, your kids may have retinal display, so it, there's almost no distance. So when they look out at the world, they don't see the world the way you saw it. They see data mapped over everything. They see virtual worlds. They see game characters walking the streets of Brisbane, and the game characters sitting in the coffee shop, representing their, their buddy or something. Or they're doing active gameplay in the streets of Brisbane. But all of the sci-fi books about the mid 21st century have this augmented reality thing overlay constant overlay of information so then the very pixels of reality like the fact that you look across this valley and you see this volcanic plug you won't just see the volcanic plug and take it in and wonder what it is there will be data about it like this is a basaltic plug and such and such and there's you know there's psilocybin mushrooms growing here, you know, f only good for the next day. And then there's such and such is going on, and there's a farmer here, or there's a cop, cop car there. And you'll see it all, it'll be laid over the landscape. And if you don't have that, you'll be considered illiterate. And you'll be considered you can't, you can't exist if you don't use, if you're not wearing, you know? So, but then the world that is starts to dissolve right it's dissolving it's being being merged with pixels and with data sheets and sheets of data and so the perspective so the perspective went like this and then bounced off of us through technology and now the entire world's becoming technology you know is this is this a, a picture that you like to would are, are you digging this picture is it a positive picture is it realistic? Mm. The question is the threshold level. Well, I know it's coming because I work with NASA and astronauts and others have heads up displays where they, this is already the world they live in on the space station. They're watching, everything is marked with data and they live in a total encased technology because they're maintaining a giant machine with 10,000 pumps and fans and things that they have to keep maintaining to keep themselves alive. But it doesn't sound like a really good future, does it? Does it sound like a good future? No. no. So what we, we're, we may be trapped in that future because we're trapped in the, the present now. I mean, how many people sit in front of a, a, a computer screen for at least two, three hours a day in their job? Like we're, we're, we're in that, right, and it's nice big flat screen TVs, we're sort of trapped there. And we come out to Earth Frequency, why do we come out for Earth Frequency? To get away from a party, but we're, to get some Earth Frequency, yeah? To party, but to smell the air and to not be able to use your phone, right? bring your kids so they can see there's gum trees and there's cicadas and there's all that stuff, right? The reality, we come to the emerald dot. We come to the emerald dot. So the challenge that we have, and I think that this is, this is bigger news than almost anything else that's going on because it's creeping up on us so slowly, right? We can blame the government. We can talk about peak oil. We can talk about the illiterate, you know, the illiterati conspiracy of the Illuminati and all these sorts of things and invent all these terrible things to worry about or chemtrails or whatever but what is actually happening is coming up like the tide 
And it's this gradual mycelial spread of technology into our very you know, core and our bodies. And it's slicing our time up. Because remember the clock that was made by the monks? That was a daily clock. And then the town crier was reading the news once or twice a day, looking at the clock and reading the broadsheet. How often do you look at your phone You know, when you're busy? Every time you look at your phone and you get a check-in and you get a message or a text or something, you chop your mental space up. It creates a break in your concentration. Chop, 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 chop. If you applied for a grant in the 80s or even the 90s, the 70s or 60s, to say, I'm going to take, you know, I'll just take a, a random group of 12-year-olds, put them in a room, give them these glowing boxes, that will stimulate them 600 times in a day or 700 times and they'll have to respond to the thing on the box 700 times a day. You couldn't get a research grant. It was, you're torturing our children, you know, you're pr subjecting them to a terrible thing that will affect their early childhood development, right? You couldn't get a grant for this. But this is what everyone's children are doing. Everyone is doing this hundreds of times a day. Stimulus response, stimulus response, cortisol, cortisol, fight or flight, the cheetah. Every time we look at a screen and our eyes da dart around, we squirt cortisol. We have uh, a response, a, a literally a response in our physiology, you know, and it pumps our adrenal system. And then we get adrenal fatigue so that by the afternoon we need a coffee, you know, you need a flat white here in Australia. So it's a chemical thing now. It's just this chemical cycling. Bam, 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 bam. That's hitting our minds, right? Am I painting a dire picture? or Now, for some people, this is nirvana. This is nerdvana, <laughs> right? They just love the stimulation. And for several years, you know, I was just rocking away in virtual worlds and the internet. And it's like, I was wired. You know the magazine Wired? It's called Wired because it's the feeling you get when you're online and your ars, eyes are darting around and you're doing a whole lot of shit and you feel so wired because of the cortisol and the adrenaline, right? That's what it was about. That's why it's called Wired. So some of us, it's like incredible. We just surf that. You know, our minds can surf all the, those texts and inputs and just we're ready for the next set and we're ready for the next set. And some of us make billions on that surfing at the expense of maybe others. Did you know that in Silicon Valley, somebody put their hand up uh, just in the last six months and said, let me point out that all of the billionaires, all the, the mega wealth, the trillion dollars of wealth that has been created since the year, say 2002, has been created by companies stealing time from people. And you say, well, what do you mean? Well, Facebook, LinkedIn, any kind of online social network took employee time, took personal time because, well, it gave us something back, didn't it? But it took unpaid time from billion, a billion people, two billion people basically became workforces for these companies. They were not compensated. This is where their wealth came from. They soaked that out of us and they, they, it just happened. Isn't that amazing? So all of this is going on. Does this paint an interesting picture for you? <laughs> What's going on? So how do we, do we just continue to go up this curve? Here's the question. We continue to go up this curve. Terence McKenna back in the day when I was doing some work with him, he had this idea of the eschaton. Do you remember the eschaton? I always thought it meant scatology or the study of shit or something. <laughs> Eschaton or some eschaton. Well, what do you mean, Terence? Is this like poop? And what is it? He said, No, no. It's it's that we can't conceive of life continuing to go on this curve forever. It has to reach some kind of a break point. I think he was right. I think he picked 2012. He didn't live to see it. But what if it isn't some kind of doom and gloom thing? What if? Our little monkey minds are being driven harder and harder and harder. We're going up this curve. It actually means our minds are becoming incredibly more tripped out, more stimulated, more able to be aware of the world, 
more able to take in massive amounts of data, more able to apply intuition because our kids are being trained into that much more than we are. Our kids are so fast, right? So fast. So we're going up this incredible curve. Every time there's a curve where there's a trend in society, there's always its opposite. There's always the shadow. There's always the opposite. And it's often hidden. And I think in this case, this is, there's a hidden thing climbing as we're climbing. So that hidden thing has got to be frickin' powerful, doesn't it? Right? If we're going into this incredible, insane, intense thing of being able to do 20,000 projects at once. You know, I'm a kind of example. I've run five careers at the same time. But I hit the burnout wall a couple of years ago. Bam! My internal dynamo shut down. I was like, whoa. And my mother died, and my father died, and my dynamo stopped. And I actually hit that wall. And I think that when people hit that wall and their dynamo stops, you know, they have a death in the family, they just work too much. They burn out their adrenal system. They have what's called adrenal shock syndrome. Then they reach for the medications, right, that the pharma is giving us to keep us going up, right? So that's dangerous. And now they're no longer running on their own juices. They're running on Xanax. They're running on SSRIs. They're running on that, right? So they're continuing to climb. But for some reason, we're being driven harder and harder and harder. Are we being driven by ourselves? Do we need to be working this hard and doing all this stuff? Do we need Facebook? You know, do we need the, ex the acceptance and love of 5,000 people we've never met? Do we need this every day? Do our kids need that? Well, we seem to be bringing it into being. Does anyone, can, anyone suggest why, we, why are we bringing this into being? Is there a reason? Evolution. <coughs> Evolution. Okay. Any others? Connection. Connection. Disconnection. Disconnection. Why are we bringing this thing into being? What makes you think it's us bringing into being? Question, what's our time remaining for the spoken part of the... So I would like to suggest... Uh, an answer to this, if I can come up with it in the next minute. <laughs> so, so 35 minutes left, including questions? Including questions. As he looks at his, I see his, his glowing azure come out and I like, I'm, I'm looking at that. It's like it's giving me reassurance that things are all in order. <laughs> so what I want to suggest is that if we don't, if we can look at this thing as being bad, we can look at this thing as being something we're trapped in. If we look at it, it's like being on a trip. If it's like if you take something very strong, an elixir, I call them, and, and suddenly the world is, sh is incredibly overdriven. The world is incredible information, and your mind is in an incredible heightened state, and you're seeing all this stuff which is actually what the future is going to be like, right? Because we're making that future. You could say to yourself, I'm really disturbed by this. This is just terrible. And suddenly all those wiggling things and faces and whatnot will turn into something scary and something negative because the trip will go south on you because you kind of cast it that way. Whereas the innocence among us that just are tripped out by. They're just amazed by what is coming in. They tend to just let anything come in. And maybe the experienced trippers are like, ah, I've been here before. I can either think bloody hell, not, not again, <laughs> right? Or I could say, um, let's make this really work for us. Let's make this work for us. Let's explore the beauty of the acacia and the world that it opens up the origin world. Let's see if that thing that I just took opens up the origin world so I can learn about it. And it does, right? So you psychic explorers, in a sense, have the best tools and you're developing the minds that can handle 
the chaos of this civilization, this thing that is rising, that we're rising in, whether it's cooked up by somebody else, whether we do it too, because you're going into these high spaces, these elevated spaces, and this could be through Vipassana, it doesn't have to be through taking an elixir. It can be through meditation, Vipassana, you know, Tai Chi, all these energetic practices. You're out ahead of the curve. You're saying, I know how to manage chaos. You know, you ain't, you phone, you text messaging demon, you ain't seen nothing yet compared to what I've experienced. You know, come on, this is just, this is nothing. So our little brains are cruising into spaces that are ahead of this wave of technology. And I think that when we go into those highly energized state spaces, we establish agency. We have presence. We can handle it. Sorry, but we can handle it. And so when life throws us this chaotic system, the Facebook posts or the angry emails from the boss or just the continuous flood, we actually have trained ourselves to say, shamanically, we're just going to navigate through it. We're going to quiet down this part of it. We're going to say, go away. We're going to decide energetically that this little thing coming in from the side can be put to, re put to sleep so that we can be clearer. So I think really that's what's happening. And it's what's happening here at Earth Freak is these, it's a training center you know, in all these stages that are here and the great food and the stimulation and the power of this land is training your mind to, to ride a course that's higher and more profoundly powerful than whatever so-called civilization can throw at you. You can be in command of it and you can hold your center and because your center is held much higher up. So maybe that's part of here's what's coming up and here's the hidden force that's coming up. That, that balances and counterposes it. And you're all part of that hidden force. And at one point, there's going to be a coming to reckoning. You know, in Australia, you say, I reckon, you know, I reckon. So it's going to be a great big, I reckon, <laughs> right? A huge, I reckon. <laughs> and it's, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a reckoning. And I think the more, <laughs> the more of us that decide, like for example, I'm writing a book called The Little Book of Endo, E-N-D-O, which stands for endogenous tripping. I have met people, since I was on the Joe Rogan podcast, I announced that I was writing this book about people who could endogenously journey, right? And now I'm flooded with people who can endogenously journey. Joe warned me about this. But now I'm doing interview after interview after interview. People do it on the natch. People do it through lucid dreaming. People do it through meditation. People who are just walking down the street and suddenly they're in a crossed over state. And they're seeing mathematics. Or they're witnessing incredible stuff and they haven't like smoked, drank, or shot anything into their bodies at all. It's just endo. It's all endo. And then there's the trippers that understand the psychedelic realm that do endo too and compare, compare notes. Like, hmm, I can mix and match these things. But the endo world is rising. And the endo world is rising, I think, because of the nerd world rising. You know, we went into the age of Aquarius, what, in 1967, right? Age of Aquarius. Remember that? We've gone into the age of nerdquarius now. So it's nerds that are running the world. The nerd mindset, all everybody becomes a server operator. Everyone manages processes and tasks and operating systems, which when I started in computing in 81, I was like an alien to my whole town. You're working in computers? You know, aren't they, you know, so weird that we can't even talk to you, you know? They won't, you know, your mother or your mo friend's mother won't even talk to you because they think you're some god because you computers. You know, now, you know, that's, that's ludicrous, right? So, the age of nerds, and so all these endo-trippers. And one of the fellow I interviewed back in Maryland, what he does, is he said, I gave him the term endo. He didn't have a word for this. Yeah. 
I don't say so far away. There's a great big fire over there. Oh, we will not notice that for a minute. Um, so, the age of Endo. So this guy, he would look at a Beatles album cover, get on his school bus, and he would close his eyes, and he was in, in, he was in Yellow Submarine, just boom, the whole thing. And he would tell his, his mates at school, and they said, you can't do that, not on drugs, you're, you're crazy, and you're lying to us. So he stopped talking about it. Right now, he's a patent attorney. He goes into Endo, you know, his wife is going like, hello, and he's open-eyed, and he's in a trip, in a mathematics trip. And he said four years ago, and he, because we were, during our conversation he cut, started calling it an app. He said the app got just too intense. It started trashing my whole operating system, so I shut it down. And then last April I allowed the app to reboot. And I was in this world, and I was better. I don't know what it was, the app was better behaved. Maybe the system had had an update, you know. And the app was fine, and now I'm doing it again. I do it for my work. So this is new. Why is this new? Because our brains have been reshaped by interaction with technology that we can do this shit now. Back in the past, we would have attached to it. So for instance, Joan of Arc, when she heard the voices in her head, she attached it to religion, to the strong religious trends of her time, right? Maybe perhaps as late as the 80s, people that had an endo vision attached strongly personally to it in almost an ego sense and they created something called the new age right so people who had full openings to something you know that the a beautiful scene of dolphins for example attached strongly to it and that became their identities in the in the nerdiest age i think nerds are a little skeptical because it's, they think of themselves as like an operating system and these are like apps so they hold distance from it and i think that makes them much more powerful much more powerful because they're not attaching to it and they're watching it and they're managing it so they don't let it take over their lives does that make sense when stuff starts coming and i think this is a big part of that other wave that's going up this idea of endogenous visioning and i think it's rising all over the world now so instead of having to come out to a, a green emerald dot like this in a special setting and take a special elixir or even to go and sit in Vipassana or even to do a practice these people are able to go into realms on their own on the Natch in Endo and see incredible stuff and something is going on I don't quite know how to see it but there's some evolution that is going on in humanity that's okay with the chaos in fact it's evolving tools and techniques to manage it even better and so endogenously all of us could end up in a single global mind you know they talk about the global mind the group mind the group intention when you put a strong intention out suddenly there's all this room full of people and they're doing it and they have the same intention they have the same vision all that shit is going on it's all endogenous and we're all part of a carrier wave of something so I think that all that craziness that's coming up here is being matched by incredible evolution and openings that are coming right up here and I place myself over here on this side I choose to be an optimist about it and I choose to make it my practice and so how I do that is I go into Pentagon think tanks. I'm a member of Pentagon think tanks. I go into Swiss banks. I created the vision for the software that runs the cantonal banking system in Switzerland, right? I go into NASA and I try to shape NASA because I come from this side. I'm not afraid of the bureaucracies. I'm not controlled by anything I'm a free agent you know and I can come in and intuitively go in and use endogenous techniques to say let me load the cultural operating system of that general and become that general for an instant then I can see the world through their eyes and then I can use an acronym that they all use and I can say well, what about such and such that damned out of control executive branch which they're all complain complaining about in the US the stupid White House that's sending them on these missions they don't want to do that they know are bad 
And this is the internal dialogue in the Defar Department of Defense. And the complaints about the CIA, there's this whole cultural war going on. So I get inside that so I can be them. And then I can make a little tiny suggestion of, have you guys thought of this? And the guys go, oh, that's interesting. And then I can see them going off. And I did this to NASA six, seven years ago. And NASA went off and it came back in 2009 with a new mission objective, which was exactly what I put into the system through a big, big story. I did a design of how to take humans to an asteroid. I said, wouldn't this be cool actually? Oh, now that's what they're doing, you know. So I've, I've learned that in standing on this side and the chaos and the disorganization and the overdrive, whatever it is on this side, in the clarity side, using intuition, a little bit of the elixir sometimes or not, endo, strengthening practices like we do, energetics, real social networking, pulling myself apart, dealing with my own healing and my own ego and, and putting that on the shelf, watching that ego thing so it doesn't get in the frickin' way. You can move like a shaman through all these worlds and you can do all this wonderful change and affect things and learn what's going on. I think more of us are doing that too now. You know, the Silicon Valley boys, you know, Elon Musk and all these crazies, before they become corrupted oligarchs, they're actually doing really good things in the world. You know, it's amazing what these guys are. The electric car, the Tesla electric car, and all the initiatives that they have because they're shamanic. They're not, they're not threatened by Congress or militaries or governments or the banking system. They say, fuck that. I went to Burning Man. <laughs> I went to Burning Man. I went and drank ayahuasca in the jungle. You know, I don't fucking care about any of that shit. That's just, that you can push that over. You can, man, you can shape that shit. Uh, I have a friend who worked on the movie Avatar. You know, the movie Avatar, which, you, have you all seen it? Cameron's, they're making three more right now. They're working three more. Did you know that that is an ayahuasca film? It's on the DVD. Good point. Scully drinks a brew and beats his spirit animal in the five, four or five minutes that were cut out, right? But it's on the DVD. Tell Jim Cameron to rewrite the films and tell the truth. Well, here's what's going on. This is a diversion, but it's a happy diversion. Guess what we're doing for Jim Cameron now? Jim Cameron is... I'm part of a committee of people that is designing this thing. It's called the Navi Camp. <coughs> Navi Camp. It's a camp for kids, which will train them and allow them to experience the Navi way. Stewardship of the planet. Get yourself long dreadlocks. You know, <coughs> get blue skin. We, we were told by an advisor, all these kids are going to want one thing. When they leave, they want a picture, a selfie with them with blue skin. That's, a, that's the absolute minimum. <laughs> but they're going into Navi camp. And Navi camp is going to be almost a psychedelic, incredible initiation rite. The thing, you should see the design for this thing. Unbelievable. And Cameron is like waiting for the final version of this thing. Because he wants his films to go into society. To is reaching all these people and the requirement will be that all the cast and crew of the avatar films will have to go through navi camp all of them everybody from techs and key grips and the accounts and everybody you're going so that's it cool right that's it because cameron is like not afraid of any fucking thing right he says we can help re-engineer society based on powerful stewardship principles of the planet I just made, you know, I'm going to make 10 billion from these films and I'm going to reach 3 billion humans. That's power. <laughs> Sorry, but that's real power. You know, and ayahuasca rises on the other side. You know, so I would kind of put Cameron's efforts on this side of the curve. Right? And as you start realizing how many people are working on the shamanic side of the curve now, they're over here and you just realize 
Oh my God! You know, in Australia, the good old boys network that 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 crazy woman, the mi- who's the mining billion billionaire lady. What's her name? She's definitely on this side, right? <laughs> but it's amazing if we can attract some of these people with a lot of agency over to the other side. If it can be a net flow of them over here, we just empower this side. And because you're here, because the festival scene is rising in Australia, in the the so-called underground, the underground's coming to above ground. This side is becoming public, right? <clears throat> Does this all make sense? Does it make you feel a little better about dire predictions? So to wrap this up, anybody else have? Throw your hand up and say, uh, "Does anything uh, occur to you?" Sorry. Oh, feed all the politicians ayahuasca. You might get them going. Gina Reinhardt. Oh my gosh. Maybe give her acacia. You know. Any other uh, jumping ups? So, in, in a sense, to, to wrap up my rap, the, think of your own life in these terms, I think. Think that you can be over here. You can be coming from the magic. You can channel magic. You can have endogenous visions. You ha- can have the elixir visions. You can do practices that are energetic and, and, and strengthen. You can do Tai Chi. You can do yoga. You can do all those things. That's over here. It belongs to you. Don't let the culture steal that from you. Just say, fuck the culture, and just build that up. And then the people that are over here, help them out. The people that are just completely frantic and afraid of everything, and thinking it's all going to hell in a handcart, help them out. Because if they think it's going to hell in a handcart, if they think it's a big conspiracy, they're disempowered. They have no power. They've given up. They've lost. But they've created the bad trip. That's not reality move them over here bring them to earth freak you know send them something to read something to watch something sit with them have a coffee with them and you know after eating the food here and breathing the air here do you feel your minds are are different they change your skin is glowing and yeah i mean i feel it i'm totally rejuvenated I'm, i was living in campbelltown for a week in Sydney and I got that whole Campbelltown thing and it's a good thing to come here after that and start glowing yeah um, it was good too it reminded me of the people I grew up with in Canada but um, so the supposed psychopath mind lacks some peace that allows a person to have empathy and in Canada they've kind of recognized this and they said you know what the, the schoolyard bully and the victim of the schoolyard bully are both part of a process of sort of psychopathic, sociopathic thing that, that appears later in life. So in Ontario, they worked out the following to, to cut this in the bud, because it all starts with early childhood, right? They created a buddy system. So if you're a little, and I wish I'd had this when I was a little kindergarten kid, because you're a little kindergarten kid and you're all kindergarten kids together, right? It's all one great big family. But then you go to the big school, right? And these kids are much bigger than you. In Canada, it was like one to seven. So I arrived there and I was just terrified. It's like, it was like unbelievably terrifying. But in, in Canada now, they have this buddy system. So a student who's two years older than you is assigned to be a buddy and picks you out of the lineup just usually by making eye contact and they, they kind of come together and that's your helper from that point and they thought it would last a year or two it's lasting through lifetimes so the little kids have a buddy that's this much taller than they are and they the buddy is so proud these kids have to go through like a vetting process to become a buddy for a little kid it, you, you, it's not because the little kid class is only this big and there's all these other big kids so only a certain number can be buddies so they're fighting to become buddies because then they have this special friend and they're showing them a school right 
this is what happens. This is what really happens, not what the teachers say, right? And go to this corner, and you know, there's all this crazy stuff going on. And as these kids grow, they the friendship bond is incredible. It's incredible. So the kids going up through, there isn't any bullying. If a little kid, if a kid that's slightly smaller than another kid is getting picked on, there's a huge swarm because you do not do that. That could be the buddies come swarming to protect the little kid. It's, you know, bullies dare not, dare not. So there's this natural inborn. It was smart. It was called mentorship, older brother. You know, that wasn't the evil older brother, but a good older brother. And it was good that it's not brothers that are doing this, because you know what brothers are like. It's another kid. So that has caused a ripple through the Canadian school system that no, the, the planners are like, this is breathtaking, the change. And now it's rippling into society. It's like, this is so good. This has reduced our levels of all these things that were bad in society could be traced back to this one innovation in Ontario. So every time we come up with something like that, whoa, that's a big change. That's a big change. So the 19th century, they're lining these kids up with the first gas lighting and the first electric lighting to kind of rote blast into their brains such that they could work in factories, right? That's a pretty harsh start for education, modern education. Now we're refining it such that the shaping of a better society can be made possible through this system that started with such awful premises in the beginning. And things are getting better. They're really getting better. So that's all on this side as well. That's, that's totally enlightened human engineering, you know, by somebody out there. Any other? I want to show you a special artifact that I brought here to Earth Freak. And I don't know if you can see on the front, but it's a really beautiful young man with long hair and flowers. He's got like a braid. This is a Greek festival goer 2,500 years ago. He's a tripper. He's dancing. They're going with Bacchus. They're going with all the other elixirs, you know. But inside here is... this shell. Can you see sort of it's a little little shell? <clears throat> On the other side of the shell is some sort of amalgam stone. This shell was taken from the lowest foundation of the temple at Eleusis in Greece. The foundation that's 1700 BC, 1500 BC. This temple held an initiation rite once a year in September for a thousand people. It was a sunken into the ground. The people went through six months of preparation through what are called the Lesser Mysteries in Athens. They came from all over the world of antiquity. As long as they could speak some Greek, they were allowed to do it. You could be Augustus Caesar, future emperor. You could be Cleopatra. You could be a slave. You could come. You had the right to come once in your life to Eleusis. What happened at Eleusis? It's been pieced together now, what happened at Eleusis. So the people came, a thousand of them. They went through initiation in, in the oceans around Athens, then they marched them up in September. This is kind of like a great big burning man or earth frequency. And they, were, they went through the plains of Eleusis, and alongside them was barley growing, and on the barley were smuts, blue and purple, kind of discolorations, little mushrooms, claviceps purpurea, from which the women who ran Eleusis made a beverage, a drink called the Kaikion, which may have had basically gold tops or probably blue meanies in them, right? Would have had that, could have had detura in it, but these women dialed the potion in exactly so it wouldn't kill the initiates. It's not a good idea to kill your initiates. And so a thousand people went for nine days to Eleusis. They were on fasting diets. They were on, they wore all the same clothing. They were reduced down to being equal. All their status in life was made equal. 
so that an, a future emperor would look into the eyes of a slave, who would look into the eyes of a seaman, of a fisherman, and they were all human beings. And then they went into the temple, and the, the temple, then the sound and light show started. Incredible reverberations of cymbals and clashing, is, you know, would blow these bands out of the water if you were there. I mean, this temple was built as a sonic resonator, smoke and light. The women came down with these huge pots on their head and they started to dance into the crowd and it contained the kaikion. And then at a certain moment, they were, everyone was served this drink. And they drank the drink and they sat on the bench seat from which this was taken. My fantasy is that Aristotle peed on this. You know, when you're in something like that, you gotta take a leak, you gotta take a leak, right? So Aristotle's there, you know, peeing on this. You know, Cleopatra was sitting on it with her beautiful derriere, and things like that. There's this, this very shell which represents the Mediterranean and Greece. And then what happened, as described by Plato and many of the great minds of the time, was a light came up. Everyone stood up and a light rose. And for them it was the myth of Persephone's return the power of light coming from the underworld and life returning to the earth to Demeter, the mother. It's a beautiful, beautiful legend that has been repeated in, in the Far East and in, in the classical world. And this light came and everyone describes this as almost nothing known but what they drank, but what they saw was the light of the in infinite. They con had contact with God at the highest level everyone had that experience that changed them for the rest of their lives and they left they had time to integrate they had months to get back home they didn't have a life we didn't have they didn't come out of the temple at Eleusis and suddenly get a bunch of text messages you know they had time to integrate and my my claim here is they went and they built civilization all the good things in civilization you know like what have the Romans done for us you know aqueducts and sanitation and the polity and the senate theater the academy mathematics all those good things that that served human beings then in 396 a.d and this is where i'll wrap it up 396 a.d rome was falling rome was crumbling why because of oligarchs because of psychopaths that went into the system as governors and basically extracted all value and money for themselves and they were crashing civilization right that's how Rome fell and then uh, so this was happening Rome was falling and so what Constantine had done for 60 years before he had created the councils of Nicaea where he brought together these bishops that sort of had by second and third hand inherited a tradition by this guy named Jesus of Nazareth they corporatized it, packaged it, and, made, and stamped four Gospels as official, cranked out this official user's guide, and then in the middle of it, the Catholic Apostolic Church split off here from the, you know, the Eastern Orthodox Church, which was mostly Greeks, so they had these screaming, uh, screaming uh, diatribes against each other, and they finally split. And they were doing all kinds of things like planting prostitutes in the in the chambers of other bishops so they get kicked out of the councils and things like this. It was horrible, right? So they had corporatized this so that Constantine could wipe out all of the pagan festivals and save money. It was a, it was a security and cost-saving measure. They wiped out all of those festivals. They, the pantheon of gods became saints. You know, let's do it. We're, we're running out of, you know, we're in a debt crisis. And so in 396 AD, Alaric was coming in from the north, and Alaric re represented the old bloodletting, the old Upper Paleolithic. And he met on the road uh, these black-robed Christians from the councils of Nicaea, these bishops, who were described at the time as being ze zealous, binary-thinking, intolerant individuals. You know, they were just really awful individuals that nobody wanted to be around. I mean, they're worse than pilgrims. And they were coming in and they met Alaric and they said, good that we met you because we need your muscle. We're going to a place called Eleusis and we need you to smash this temple. You're good at smashing cities, that's what you guys do. You sack cities and they did it. 
and, and the temple at, Lu at Lucis was destroyed utterly. And I, I, I posit to you that, we, that that culture that came in, that was an inferior culture that replaced the, the privilege and the idea that you had the right to have direct contact with God and a transformative experience that turned you into a human being which it, and made the, the modern world, made civilization with a system of taxation and you have no right to have contact with God until your death and only you can only pass through those pearly gates if you've done all our rules and you know the retirement system is based upon this right all of this is based on this it's putting it off so that a huge bureaucracy can sap its res your resources and that inferior culture from 396 AD with the smashing of the temple of Eleusis is coming down we're here to do that Right, we're initiating ourselves and our children. We're we're seeking con direct contact with power and the ineffable. That's what all this is, because why we become human beings, and then we notice that those who are leading us, who haven't been through initiation, are carrying these juvenile tendencies into adulthood, and they're just behaving like little schoolyard bullies. And at one point, we're going to say, guys go sit in the corner, time out. That's it, put your hands together for Bruce Daimar. As I had mentioned back in this 2015 talk, my friend Dave Muffley did successfully plant his massively diverse oak forest and fruit orchards on the new Apple campus, which just opened over the hill from here at Ancient Oaks. So Dave has painted a little bit of emerald in a sea of azure in the heart of Silicon Valley. In fact, his pre-adapted forest of hot climate oaks envelops the ultimate avatar of the azure, the now iconic Apple World Headquarters building known locally as the Spaceship. Dave himself was here just last week, for a recorded conversation on this work, which will be featured in a future Levity Zone episode. Here is a little report on my very successful and fun recent trip to the North Island of New Zealand. I attended and presented our Origin of Life hypothesis and the Shepard spacecraft design at a wonderful astrobiology conference held in Rotorua, in the center of the active volcanic landscape which lifted New Zealandia, the world's smallest protocontinent, out of the Tasman Sea. Journeying deep into the many and varied hot spring settings, we picked Hell's Gate, in which for two days I immersed a hot block containing 98 vials of dried lipid and some of the building blocks of RNA. I dutifully, and in many cases through a mental fog of sulfuric fumarole vent vapors, carried out Dave Deemer's protocol of four wet-dry cycles in as many hours, injecting tiny portions of acidic and alkaline hot spring waters into each vial. Early results from our lab at UC Santa Cruz reveal copious amounts of polymers, presumably strands of RNA, stitched together in the wet-dry cycling between the layers of lipid. Surprisingly, it seems that we produce far more product than our clean and optimized lab setup ever did, strongly suggesting that this environment is a potent place for prebiotic chemistry to get started. More field work may be in the works in a risky and audacious move to synthesize these polymers and encapsulate them in lipid protocells directly in hydrothermal sediments. These are exciting, heady times, even though being face down in the hot spring environment can get a bit too heady at times. Thanks to Kathy Campbell, Ray Wright, Paul Rayner, and Brian Drake for all of your help in making these very first Origins of Life science experiments carried out in the wild a seeming success. See a few shots and a documentary shot on site by the New Zealand Herald on the page for this podcast episode. Oh, and thanks to Travis and Caro Nobles for hosting me in Wellington at the end of my trip and getting me in the door of Weta Workshop, 
the famous special effects studio and physical props house, which created The Lord of the Rings and contributed to 50 other films. After I presented a talk to the Wettons, we were given a personal tour of the workshop by none other than its co-founder, Sir Richard Taylor. On the tour, and attending my talk, was Peter Lyon, perhaps the greatest sword maker in the world today. When I arrived at his studio workshop, he placed into my hands Glamdring, the sword wielded by Ian McKellen when he played the role of Gandalf in the Rings trilogy and in The Hobbit. It was a mighty sword and barely wieldable by me, a former college fencer. Sir Richard said that when he first set eyes on me, I gave him a double take, him thinking that I bore not just a passing resemblance to Gandalf, at least a younger version of Ian. Perhaps then I could be cast in a pre-pre-prequel of the films as Gandalf the Greying. Find some photos of my adventures around New Zealand and a nice shot with Peter, Sir Richard, and Glamdring on the page for this podcast. Also find photos of the fun times had at the Earth Frequency 2015 Festival and scenes of yours truly in the Speaker Village Dome radiating emerald and azure visions into the cicada scintillated gum forests around us. Thanks go out to Kristoff for cleaning up the audio of this episode, to Transporter for taking the photo of me back at Earth Freak, and to Becca Dakini and Alima for arranging my tour and hosting me all over Eastern Australia. Find this in all past episodes and subscribe today to not miss several exciting upcoming new ones at www.levityzone.org or by using the keyword Levity Zone in your favorite podcast player. See you next time in the Levity Zone.